Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Howard Shalansky, and I want to welcome you to the first of these CPI uh, antitrust and election year uh, sessions. We've just heard from Commissioner Phillips. We're going to follow up today with a really distinguished set of panelists who are going to talk about whether antitrust is in need of a new framework and put that in the context of some of the proposals and some of the changes that might be coming as we move through this election cycle and into a new Congress and um, uh, into a new presidential cycle. Uh, very pleased to have with us today uh, folks that probably all of you know. Uh, we have uh, Karen Wong Irvin, a partner at Axon. Uh, we have Bill Baer, a former uh, Assistant Attorney General, uh, currently at the Brookings Institution. Bill, of course, also former Bureau, Bureau Director at the FTC and former Associate Attorney General. I put that below his August antitrust posts. Um, we also have Jeffrey Manny, the uh, President and Founder of the International Center for Law and Economics and uh, Professor Tim Wu from Columbia University Law School, and of course, a well-known uh, commentator on these issues who also has had valuable experience contributing at the Federal Trade, Trade Commission and uh, at OMB in the executive branch. Um, so I look forward to a really uh, terrific panel and I, I think some very interesting views. I'd like to start the panel off by asking each of you just very briefly to address first whether you think antitrust needs rethinking. And if so, what is the single biggest problem with current antitrust enforcement that a new framework needs to address? And if not, what is the single biggest risk to antitrust enforcement from some of the proposals that are out there or from engaging in a reopening of the framework? And to start us off, I'd like to, to, to start with, uh, with Tim. Let me uh, unmute myself. Thanks, uh, Howard. Great to, great to see you. Hi, everybody. Um, as Howard noted, I'm wearing a tie for some reason today, for I think the first time in seven months. Uh, it feel, it's an interesting feeling. So um, yeah, what, let me uh, answer the question. Howard, I'm going to cheat and say two things. Um, so the two things I, I think have to happen is we need a rethinking of, of uh, enforcement policy and how the agencies go around enforcing cases. Um, and, you know, I, I, there's very talented staff and, and leadership at both these places, and they, they generally do a decent job. But I think we need to move away from the model where the uh, agencies kind of sort of sit back. Um, they, um, uh, and they're not, this is a little stereotype, but they, you know, they wait to see if any good cases roll in. And uh, if not, they don't do anything. And uh, if so, then they, they bring kind of piecemeal litigation, uh, win one here, win one there, and, and don't really achieve much in the way of, of, of deterrence, much in the way of a policy, much in the way of giving industry a sense of what their concerns in it's more just kind of a, like a poker player who uh, goes in on the good hands and i i don't think that's uh good for industry i don't think it's good for the agencies and i think it has hurt uh, antitrust enforcement i don't think all of it's been like that i think sometimes uh, if you think about campaigns like pay for delay or um, the state action cases early 2000s the, the hospital merger cases these are things where the the agency uh, that, that happened to be the ftc in those three cases um, had this thing that they thought it was a problem and they just kept going at it. Um, and eventually, even though they, they would lose cases, they eventually won the whole, uh, the whole thing. And I think, uh, uh, you know, obviously not as much as they would like, but eventually got, got um, a precedent that favored the agency's view. And I think that that kind of viewpoint of making it clear what its concern is and convincing and having a sort of full-fledged campaign is what the agencies need to do uh, in the future. Uh, the other big thing I think that we need to re, uh, reboot uh, antitrust, and I guess, yeah, is, is I think there is a need for legislative change. I think there are too many um, uh, Supreme Court precedent uh, that have gone uh, uh, that have gone wrong and have stripped the antitrust law of any uh, of any uh, strength in certain areas. Um, and I think, uh, you know, the most easy legislative effort would just be to overrule a bunch of Supreme Court precedent, which has taken, has sort of um, enfeebled the antitrust laws and made the uh, staff nervous that even when they, they think that they've got a clear harm right in front of them, you know, they can see it all, they're going to have something like the Amex case where you spend years on it, only to have the Supreme Court um, come up with a cockamamie theory at the last minute that 
um, uh, that, that dooms the case. So, you know, I, I think that uh, 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 legislation to overrule uh, precedent um, is, is the other priority for antitrust enforcement. Thanks very much, Tim. I really appreciate that. Um, I, I want to turn uh, next to, uh, to, to Jeff. And um, do you agree with Tim that there are these fundamental problems with the way antitrust has evolved such that uh, there, there, there are critical problems that need addressing? If so, what would those be? And to the extent that you don't agree, what do you see in the risks uh, of the kind of thing that, uh, that, 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 that Tim is talking about? I mean, who can agree with overruling cockamamie precedent? <laughs> it's funny that you should say that because my answer was going to be, um, we need more cases to the extent that Amex is not where the, the sort of current framework is, um, what's lacking from the current framework is we need to move more in the direction of Amex. Um, so good, good thinking pointing to me right after uh, Tim. I'll, I'll explain what I mean by that is that um, uh, to the extent the current framework needs thinking, it is, um, it is perhaps a bit too static for, for today's markets. We have a bunch of, of procedural constraints we place on, on antitrust, despite what Tim said um, uh, with regards to the Supreme Court cases. Uh, uh, they, they, you know, they do, of course, impose some constraints, but they're not all in one direction. And importantly, I think um, our conception of market definition and a lot of our conceptions around uh, how petition works in dynamic markets are too constrained, not 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 constrained enough, by um, uh, by uh, the current sort of antitrust framework. I, I don't think this requires, but this is part of the the valuable evolution that we've had in antitrust law since the beginning. And, um, and I think it's evolving in more and more in that direction. I think Amex is a, an indication of that. And I think that's going to be really important going forward. I think we're going to get cases wrong more often than right if we limit ourselves very clearly to in-market efficiencies and narrowly defined markets and uh, some of the other constraints. Um, the, the uh, by the way the the complaint that dropped this morning from the DOJ against Google is a, is a great representation of this the, the complaint there is a complaint about search it defines search markets but the whole description the whole problem laid out in that complaint relates to the distribution of search under an Amex kind of analysis we should indeed be looking at the effects on these channels of distribution um, which means browsers, mobile devices, it means desktop devices, uh, it means IoT devices. Um, if that efficient, if the, the effects on that market were excluded from consideration, I think we would uh, invariably get the case wrong. And in reality, we need to look at how the minimal constraints on search seem to be benefiting those markets. And that seems to me like an Amex kind of, uh, kind of take. In terms of the costs, I think um, Noah was absolutely right that the the House report um, portends a a not just a takeover of tech but a takeover of the entire economy in many respects. It reminds me of the days of the Industrial Reorganization Act proposals in the 60s and 70s from Senator Hart. Um, this is a sort of uh, an indirect way of getting at the same thing. You, you can't accomplish, I believe, the things that the House report most wants without a pretty invasive regulatory regime and price controls to regulate access and the, the terms of access and, and the sort of the regulation of essential treating various aspects of the economy as essential facilities. I don't think that's beneficial for anyone and is a real risk. Thanks very much, uh, Jeffrey. Corinne, you've thought a lot about the House report that Jeff just referenced. Do you see the House report as addressing particularly pressing problems that are in need of addressing? Uh, if so, which ones? And looking at the House report, um, what do you see um, sort of as, as, as good and bad in, in the proposals um, uh, that, that the committee has put forward? Sure, thanks Howard and thanks the CPI for having me. So I think the report, um, you know, anyone who knows me, I'm very troubled by it, right? You're not surprised. I think it's commendable in its um, and its support for greater funding for the agencies and for the agencies to do additional st 
studies to look at the effectiveness of their past actions. Uh, but as Jeff mentioned and, and Commissioner Phillips mentioned, there's a number of proposals, at least 10 that I count, that apply across industries, not specific to digital platforms. And I find these very dangerous. I think that they risk harming consumers and innovation, that they would introduce significant uncertainty, which can serve as a tax on transactions. And just to give you a couple of, of the ones that I'm most concerned about. So definitely I'm concerned about changing the consumer welfare standards, interjecting vague and subjective notions such as democratic ideas. I'm concerned about banning mergers that result in 30% or more market share unless the company proves a negative that the merger won't harm competition. I'm worried about banning product improvements, um, including for life-saving drugs and the, if they make it harder for rivals to compete regardless of the benefits to consumers. And I'm also very worried about imposing an EU-like abuse of dominance standard um, with a presumption of 30% for dominance, which is significantly lower than the EU even uses. Um, you know, this would allow the government to regulate price through antitrust and punish other mere exercises of lawfully obtained monopoly power. Um, so, you know, I, I, I'm not in favor of legislative changes. I, I think Jeff made good points and um, case law can come more in line with modern economic thinking in a lot of ways. Um, but I would not, you know, throw out the antitrust laws I'm with. You know, I think uh, Barry Nigro said this recently at a Fordham panel, he's not ready to give up on the antitrust laws without evidence that there's a systemic problem in need of, of fixing. Thanks very much. I do have some follow-ups uh, th to that and that I think will apply yeah. to all of you, but I, I want to turn turn next to Bill and, and get your perspective on what you've heard and wh where, we, where you would see a problem for a new framework to address and, 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 and how you might uh, uh, go about that if you do. Thanks, Howard. It's a pleasure to be with this extraordinarily talented group. Um, I testified October 1 before the, the Sicily subcommittee and elaborated a bit on what I had submitted in writing. To me, credit to Tim, there is an under enforcement issue. There is a legitimate concern with that, but it is under enforcement that uh, uh, it is dictated to by the courts. And uh, we have courts that have gotten increasingly cautious about when to find an antitrust violation, whether it be an acquisition or, or conduct. And that is leaving a lot of bad conduct on the table. I describe it as a pretty much of a one-way ratchet. It gets turned in the direction that imposes a higher and higher burden of proof. So the question is, and this judiciary uh, is not gonna get any less conservative uh, in the next few years. And so, you know, but I honestly believe the, are, there are smart people who will apply the law as written. So my sense is you do need some modest changes, both to Section 2 and to Section 7 of the Clayton Act in order to instruct the courts to be more assertive, to err on the side of enforcing the antitrust laws and not uh, be so afraid that over enforcement will destroy our market based economy. That's my focus. Thanks very much, Bill. I, I, I want to come back with a couple of a couple of different questions that build on this. Tim made the point that there is some doctrine that is embedded in the case law. There's some precedent that at this point um, might be contrary to what we have learned and understood about how economics work in practice and that may be leaving a lot of harms um, uh, in the marketplace. And on the other hand, we hear from, from Jeffrey and Corinne that we, we actually have a system where legislation in changing some of these, uh, some of the doctrine and some of the presumptions could, could be quite risky. I worry a little bit that if we rely on the traditional adjudicative model for antitrust, we wind up with a situation where some of the doctrine most in need of revisiting never gets revisited by the courts and loses the ability to evolve through the common law process that antitrust typically changes through. 
because plaintiffs just don't bring the cases. And so I think about, you know, just to take an example, predatory pricing, where, you know, since 1992, there has not been an environment in which plaintiffs can bring successful federal cases. There's a lot of economic learning that says that aspects of that test that's put, that came out in the Brook Group case, actually leave a lot of predatory conduct um, unreachable by the antitrust laws. Now, one could agree or disagree, but I use it as an example of where there's quite arguably a precedent that deters plaintiffs from bringing the cases in the first place that would get courts to revisit the doctrine and evolve it through their common law process. To the extent that we have that kind of embedding of deterring doctrine that could leave harmful content, uh, uh, conduct in the marketplace, doesn't it seem a good idea periodically for Congress to come in, revisit those kinds of precedents and do the reset that the federal courts are never driven to do? Is that kind of legislative change that might be more modest than some of the things in the HJC report, something that you would see as a valuable exercise for Congress to go through? Um, and then the question that I have for, for Tim and, and for Bill is <clears throat> some of the proposals about flipping presumptions and about low thresholds, for example, for, do, for, uh, for, doctor, uh, for dominance, and, and in particular, the idea of a 30% or a less than 50%, how do we deal with the fact that there is then a deterrent at some level for companies to really charge ahead and try to do things that would greatly expand their output, greatly expand their presence in the marketplace. And indeed, sometimes there are consumer side benefits to having um, large networks and large market shares. Uh, to the extent that that could trigger a presumption of dominance and greater regulation, um, do you see a problem there on the kinds of dynamic, you know, for the kinds of dynamic competition that Jeffrey mentioned in, in his initial, uh, in his initial remarks? So first, legislative review of periodic legislative review of doctrine. Uh, uh, for for for, I'll start with Corinne, then go to Jeffrey, and then concerns about deterrent effects of flipping presumptions and lowering thresholds to Tim and to Bill. So Howard, it's a good question. Um, I, I guess I immediately think I want to ask you a question. What, what would your legislative change be? I mean, to me, just eliminating the recruitment requirement seems very dangerous, right? That um, I agree with the Supreme Court that low prices in general are a boon to consumers, right? And so um, how, what, what, what change would you make? You know, I think when we talk about alternatives, um, are they realistic and do they not have more cost and benefit? So, so I, I actually do have some substantive ideas on how I would change that. Yeah. But I think really what I wanna, because that could rabbit hole us for the rest of the okay. time here, and I'm sure we all have views on it. What I would say is, isn't that precisely the kind of question and cost benefit trade-off we want the legislature to make based on the evidence of what has actually happened in the economy and based on you know, whether there is evidence that the Brook Group precedent has excused certain kinds of conduct like you know, predatory capacity additions, uh, limit pricing, various things that might be exclusionary, notwithstanding um, lack of recruitment. And isn't the focus of recruitment a little too narrowly on price and that we could actually lose other consumer benefits that might come through innovation, product variety, other kinds of things. Putting aside what the specific rule would be, isn't it healthy, you know, given that we have had nine, we had nine justices make those trade-offs and make a decision. There are potentially significant impacts on an economy that affect people quite broadly. Isn't this uh, sort of the, exactly the kind of thing that we would want Congress periodically to come in? They might say it's the right precedent, but is it really that threatening to have legislative review periodically of these kinds of antitrust super precedents that might be deterring cases? Yeah, I, I'm not scared of the review and having a, you know, an open vigorous debate and not a process where it's result oriented, having it open to public comment, um, and really, you know, being based on the economics, do we really have a systemic problem here and, and doing the rigorous cost benefit analysis? 
I, I think, you know, one of my problems with the House report is that it's, it's very one-sided. It's based on a lot of anecdotal evidence of complaints, um, some cherry-picked facts saying that entrepreneurship is down, looking at the period from the dot-com, um, you know, boom through the Great Recession. So, uh, you know, relying on the Quoka study for the merger presumptions without even mentioning much less grappling with the widespread criticism of that study, um, including by FTC Chairman Joe Simons, an FTC economist. So as long as, you know, I, I'm all for the discussion, um, you know, I applaud the FTC for having the hearings. Um, and uh, and, and I, I do agree with you that there are some precedents that are just not gonna get there because, you know, plaintiffs are not bringing the cases. Howard, can I jump in here for a second? I would expect nothing less. Yeah, so you know, I, I just want to point out an alternative to what you're talking about. Um, if we sort of take it as a, a given that Congress, um, uh, what you've described is a very idealistic version of what Congress does, but um, the general tendency is it to do nothing. The other alternative, you know, that could change. That could change, but it hasn't um, reacted antitrust um, substantively. I guess since '70s or '50s, uh, you know, the FTC could also um, in something like predatory pricing these problems could uh, use more of its administrative function, uh, could use its rulemaking powers. It could be the expert agency that tries to take something like predatory pricing, you know, kind of deeply sift through and, and try to figure out what its own uh, ideas are for what counts as a, you know, the right. And it's, it is extremely complicated, but you know, what is below cost pricing. Um, I think Jonathan Baker had that proposal uh, that he thought the FTC should have followed up um, American Airlines basically um, with uh, some, it, with its own kind of action. So that, that's an alternative that I just want to put out there. Maybe the FTC is underdoing its job. Yeah, and, and, and I think I, I want to come back to that institutional alternative. Um, and, and look, you know, obviously none of us can be, just to be, speak very plainly, can be terribly idealistic about how Congress functions these days. But, you know, at the same time, if we are looking at, um, you know, we are looking at the body we have to revisit uh, how its statutes are implemented. And, you know, I have to have faith that folks like all of us and, you know, the many of, of thousands of people who are stakeholders in a process like this uh, would bring to bear, you know, is there a possibility of getting bad legislation? Of course there is. Um, is there a possibility of getting nothing? Uh, of course yeah. there is, but a lot could be aired through that process. And, you know, as flawed as, you know, uh, the House report and process might have been um, taking, you know, Corinne's remarks to air these ideas and make them, uh, you know, I, I think subjects of public debate is quite valuable. Um, and what, what we need to do is distill sort of as experts in the field, what are the takeaways from that? What are the things to do and not do? And I think that's what we're trying to get at here. And it would seem that one of the things we would but at least are... want to do is have Congress look at some of the precedents that might might not be uh, ones we want to keep. Jeffrey. Mm -hmm. Howard, I, I, you know, I think the problem, there's a real problem. There is a real institutional problem. You, you know, pointing to Congress, you can't just gloss over the fact that when Congress does this, it tends to look like the, the House report, um, not like, um, uh, you know, a, a expert group grappling with very complicated and conflicting economics and, you um, and changing technology and changing circumstances. Um, you know, there's a reason that we have an agency model. I'm sure we can, you know, in a very different form, we can argue that we may be overdoing that. But, you know, I, I, I you'll be surprised to hear, I, in part, I agree with Tim that, that the FTC seems like the, the right locus for this kind of uh, analysis. And even more so, the FTC can and should act as a convener I mean, and, and by the way, all of these things, the agencies already do. We, we, we run the risk a little bit of falling into the trap of suggesting that, um, you know, they're not doing any of the things that we might like them to do. Um, uh, that's, of course, not the case. And, and it's a still an open question, you know, how much of this should be done. But convening um, uh, uh, economists and, um, and, and other scholars to assess the economic consequences of existing legal rules, I, you know, seems like exactly the sort of thing that the FTC should undertake. If ultimately they think there's an, uh, you know, there's a need for legislative, uh, r reform, um, and, you know, essentially lobby Congress to, to do so, 
um, I, I would think that much preferable to a politically motivated process. I just don't, I don't think there's any reason to think they would get the economics even close to right. And of course, there's the problem that you know, legislation isn't really easily changeable. Um, uh, you know, the, the, really what we want is not even for the FTC to be making these determinations, it's to be bringing edge cases. Um, and there's nothing about Brook Group that would prevent the agencies from bringing cases that they, they think are stretches. Why, you know, that, again, they do this. This is not to say they don't do this, but, but you know, um, uh, Brook Group does not preclude making arguments about um, what constitutes below cross pricing, the possibility of uh, non-price recoupment, um, uh, you know, the, the things that you mentioned are not foreclosed by Brook Group. They might be harder to, to, to succeed on, but I don't think you're going to get tossed out on a motion to dismiss. Um, and why not use the dynamic that we have, the, the, uh, the sort of common law evolutionary dynamic to try to, to push the edges of these cases? That seems like something, again, the agencies do do, but they, should, they could do more of and would be a lot less damaging or potentially damaging than a legislative fix. It's, it's, it's very, very uh, helpful, Jeffrey. And I wanna come back on exactly these points about the FTC um, taking possibly a more administrative approach and the DOJ also pushing these edge yeah. cases. But before I do that, I wanna to go to Bill and then I wanna come back with some follow-ups on this. Thanks, Tyler. Look, I, it, it's a little anti-democratic to say that Congress is political and if Congress concludes there is a problem, it should not pass a law to address a problem. Um, and one of the two, two quick points on that, the, uh, the focus of the Cicilline subcommittee report, the, uh, the buzz has been about some of the more extreme remedies uh, proposed in the majority report, Glass-Steagall, uh, lots of prospects of rules. That misses to me what is perhaps uh, uh, an unusual bipartisan consensus. If you read the minority report uh, authored by Congressman Buck from Colorado, he is, he and his fellow members of that subcommittee are very concerned about the current state of antitrust jurisprudence in this country. They are worried about dominant firms uh, and they uh, came out in support of a number of modest modifications to the antitrust laws in addition to appropriations. And frankly, focusing on that area of consensus and moving forward with some legislative proposals is going to be the quickest way to address problems. If you agree, there are problems out there. You know, uh, I was involved in the early days of the pay for delay cases. That was in 1997. And what was it, 2013, when we got guidance from the court? Think about the consumer injury left on the table while the FTC valiantly pursued that goal. Hospital mergers, you know, the government lost every hospital challenge it brought between about 1990 and the early 2000s. And it took that great work that Tim Muris supervised at, at the FTC to show that there actually were price effects. Uh, and, and it took another couple of years for the court to slowly begin to enjoin uh, uh, contemplated or proposed mergers. In the meantime, we had two decades of consolidation, much of which actually resulted in reduced co consumer choice and higher prices. So, uh, you know, we need to look at what's the best strategy or set of strategies to address what I think are some serious uh, shortcomings in the current state of antitrust enforcement and jurisprudence, but uh, just bringing a case, taking on Brook Group and getting to a good place 10 or 12 years from now is not the only strategy, of, strategy upon which I would rely. But isn't the problem that we don't know what the good place is? I mean, th that's what really worries me is that, is that um, you, you may be right, let's say about, about the hospital mergers, for example, but the, it, it also may be the case that the more restrained sort of approach um, allowed a lot of value increasing mergers to happen that might 
otherwise have been erroneously precluded. I mean, but this is a bigger issue when it comes to the predatory pricing questions, which are, are far more difficult, I think. We're talking about applying, uh, uh, you know, a sort of um, cutting edge economics to, to complicated facts where we don't really understand. I don't think we could easily say we should reach a point where X number of uh, predatory pricing cases are successful the way you might be able to do with when it comes to mergers. It's just, it's not that binary. And, you know, in that sense, it taking a long time and, and working its way through the courts might actually be the optimal, even if, it uh, even if a shift turns out to have been what we needed and it takes 10 years to get there, the optimal process might be one that is much more iterative. If you have Congress making a decision on this today on the basis of what we know now in a way that invariably will apply more broadly than, than whatever it sort of narrowly in, intends, uh, that may be really problematic. But that argument, and then I'll turn it back to Howard, basically would, would suggest we should not have passed we should have relied on the Sherman Act. We should not have passed uh, uh, the Clayton Act. We should not have passed the FTC Act. And we should not have, in the, in the 1950s, amended the Clayton Act to make it more effective. I just don't buy the argument. Right. Yeah, I, can I jump I in a little bit? I know, Howard, this is also a way of answering your uh, second question. So that's, uh, but there is a you know, historic, the his, long historic view is also worth looking at. When, and, and to make it clear, I'm in favor of, of congressional action to sort of um, uh, re reboot the antitrust laws. One vision of it is just to like to clarify to the courts that they mean what they said they did in the Clayton Act and the, uh, uh, and the Anti-Merger Act and, and other parts of it. You know, they weren't kidding so much. Um, and there is a, as, as Bill just alluded to, there's a long a cycle of um, passing legislation, the courts kind of whittling it down, weakening it, and then Congress said, no, no, we, we meant that. That was the Clayton Act. Then they kind of gets whittled down again. You know, um, oh no, we meant it in the anti-merger. So anti-merger act 1950. So there is this cycle. It hasn't happened in a long time. And it does seem to me to support action. And this is, uh, I think, a, a sort of part of an answer towards uh, your question, Howard. You know, is there a concern about if you pass or uh, amend the antitrust laws that you might uh, deter, um, go too far, uh, uh, deter certain uh, dynamic uh, uh, consequences of, um, of, let's say, big competition. Well, you know, I wrote a book called The Curse of Bigness, stealing Louis Brandeis' title. So I, I feel like I sort of have to, to live with that. But I, I also think, if anything, um, we are way over on the other side. We're so, you know, so far um, on the under enforcement side, on the, uh, on the over concern about false negatives that um, yeah, I mean, those, those concerns that you're talking about get a huge hearing right now um, and are, are over considered, I believe. And I think it's time for a reset for other forms of, of competition uh, to be taken seriously and not just um, uh, the, the kinds that you're, you're alluding to. So that's, that's a, a brief answer. Maybe, maybe Bill wants to say more. Well, that's helpful. Yeah. I want to come back on that. I, I want yeah. to turn to Corinne and, and see if you, you have some thoughts you want to, to add following on with, to, to what you've just heard. And, and then I'll come back with another question, Tim, that Bill, Bill might Okay. Well, uh, you know, I think I know the answer, but Tim, Bill, I'd like to hear, you know, what kind of changes do you want, right? You're saying that it's gone a little too far one way and you're talking about big companies, the presumptions would be at companies of 30%. Um, it, it, and they would make companies, it would ban mergers unless you can prove a negative that your deal would not harm competition. Um, we're talking about, you know, we're not just talking about the biggest companies and we're talking about deals that the FTC has found to be beneficial in their merger respect, retrospectives with lower prices, greater output. Those would likely be banned under these proposals. Um, so, you know, when you talk about, Bill, you know, some modest on the edges, I'd, I'd love to hear a little bit about what those are. Well, um, I guess I'll take questions from Howard. Uh, but. <laughs> um, and, and I'll answer Corinne's question. Now, <laughs> you know, I, I do want to say, Corinne, I, I do just want to point out that the idea of for certain transactions or transactions of a certain size or beyond a certain share, flipping the presumption you know, it's not unknown in an American merger policy. I mean, if you look at telecommunications mergers by the terms of 
the Communications Act. You know, it is a public interest standard that requires the commission to find not that the merger wouldn't do harm, but that the commercial that the merger would have affirmative benefits. Now, the history of how that's been applied, I will admit, is a very choppy and 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 and, and dicey one. But it's certainly not unknown to have that kind of standard. And you know, certainly given the where the locus of information is, one could imagine a story that says, look, you companies know best where the efficiencies lie, where the benefits lie. You're in the best position to make a case for benefits. At a certain point, maybe that's where the burden should lie. Now, I don't think that will, in, in fact, make a big practical difference because when companies merge, they bring that case to bear. I mean, you never go into an agency in a large merger without front and center bringing with you, how does this benefit the world? So I feel like the sort of burden shifting is already something of a scrum where everybody's doing everything all the time. And it's only in a tie that there's really an issue that the legislation would address. But I guess what I want to come back to is, is the question of, you know, three institutional alternatives. Legislation, there's some things it can do quickly. It can avoid the long-term concerns of common law evolution. Uh, the concern, however, is it might draw the line incorrectly, um, but there might be things that the legislation can prune back on that are really some, some quite clear problems. So maybe legislation, a legislative approach, if it were sufficiently prudent and limited, uh, could actually be a great solution. I hear concerns that it won't be so limited the HJC report certainly indicates broad ambitions, uh, concerns about the process there. Okay, another alternative, Jeffrey, which I think you know you've you've you know forcefully advocated, made it made a strong case for, is common law evolution. Um, yes, some time might go by, but it really gives some chance for this to be thought through and worked out. You know, I have some concerns just because of the ratchet effect that Bill has talked about. And by the fact that the, the, the issues that over time might need the most attention and evolution might be the ones that are most deterred and least likely to come in. So, so the market for common law evolution, if you will, is, is one that I, I'm not sure functions very well. Um, uh, and, and Tim, you've raised the prospect, okay, let's go to the FTC. Uh, the FTC is an expert agency. Jeffrey, you seem to have uh, some sympathy for that. Um, why not go to the FTC and have them either bring bold cases with the knowledge that they may get rebuffed, but it's a way to push up against the line, and or put in place regular, you know, ex ante regulatory guidelines that, that may even go beyond simply guidance mm -hmm. and say, look, here are the areas where we won't challenge you, but if you do certain things, this is a challenge. And, and mm -hmm. Tim, I think my question for you would be, I don't wanna get into the type of rulemaking the FTC has to do and sort of the complexity of what their administrative authority is on the antitrust side as opposed to the consumer protection side. The question is how limited would the FTC be in its rulemaking by the established body of precedent? Do they have to work within that? Or does section five or their inherent authority give them an ability to go beyond that and to put in place rules that cut through some of the doctrinal accumulation, some of the presumption problems, many of the things that the HJC uh, report addresses um, uh, without being uh, 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 rejected in court for those efforts. Yes, um, I, I believe they do have that authority. Uh, by, by the way, I, I don't wanna get into, <laughs> getting a discussion with you about uh, rulemaking is a recipe for disaster. <laughs> given your expertise in this area, but I, I'm, uh, uh, you're, you're one of the world's experts on rulemakings, but I, I, uh, I do think they have authority um, under section five. And I do think that is contemplated as part of the, the, the original goal of, of the FTC. Um, some of what I think, in other words, the authority, um, not you know exactly just to erase some precedent that they don't like, um, let's say, you know because they don't feel like it, but you know, uh, some uh, it's clear, and everyone knows they have some authority that goes beyond uh, uh, Section Two and Section One of the Sherman Act and, and the Clayton Act uh, given to them by Congress. And part of it, I think, adheres in this in the rulemaking function. Uh, you know, I think the FTC would have to uh, to be successful would really have to focus on doing a good job. 
um, it, you know, it might take an area where there's already been a lot of cases and in some ways codify what it thinks is going on here um, as an initial, uh, maybe even, um, maybe pay for delay is already uh, done and, and, and gone, but you know, something where it, it does think uh, that the some of the cases it's done supports what it does, maybe uh, building on some of its settlements uh, and standard setting or something like that. And, and <clears throat> you know, the, place, the case has to be clear that you need uh, rulemaking in this area and that it would benefit from rulemaking that sort of repeat nature is much uh, better than a piecemeal approach. So um, uh, the, the, the last thing I wanna say is that, you know, most of the regulatory agencies, as you know, Howard, uh, proceed by rulemaking. It is a few exceptions, but antitrust is a pretty significant part of the American economic landscape, a uh, regulatory landscape, and it is, unusual to have it all done by adjudication. There are some advantages uh, to adjudication. We could talk about that later. Um, I, I sometimes like the posture it puts the attorneys and the economists a little more adversarial, uh, less, um, less about a, uh, uh, you know, we, we also are familiar with how the FCC sometimes uh, conducts its rulemakings. But I, I think to say that the right answer is no rulemaking can't be, be right given the nature of the complexity and the repeat nature of the problems that the agency faces. Very helpful. Um, Bill, do you want to comment on that? Having, having had to think hard about uh, the extent to which rulemakings should actually be done by the FTC on the competition side? Yeah, it, I have thought hard and my head is still hurting from that kind of thinking. Look, I, I think if there's going to be a legislative package, and as I said earlier, I think there is some hope for something to be done early in the next Congress, that one of the things that ought to be done is to explicitly confirm the competition rulemaking authority of the FTC. I think that issue, even though I think the, the residual authority exists, it's gonna be litigated to death and it would be helpful to have a congressional confirmation that that's one place. I do think targeted prospective rulemaking channels competition in appropriate ways. I think back to 2004, when the FCC uh, promulgated a rule that said, our phone number is actually our phone number and we can port it. Um, now, you know, uh, portability and, and uh, other things in, you know, with regard to tech platforms, interoperability are much more complicated than what the FCC did, did in 2004. I grant that, but, you can, I think, uh, thoughtfully and targeted ways come up with rules that will basically channel competition in a constructive way and not basically prove uh, uh, a drag on our fast-paced economy. I'd like to um, go into the, 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 the last uh, minutes that we have, you know, next 10 minutes or so, on, on, a, on a question that picks up on something Corinne noted which was that the consumer welfare standard at its, as it has come to be understood in, in over the past decades uh, has been put in play by a lot of the proposals that one sees today. And the way I think about the consumer welfare debate is this, have we become too narrowly price focused such that higher output and lower price is a defense to virtually anything? And, and in fact, one could even say higher price lower output, a broader portfolio of product variety, and uh, greater resources to innovate. Let's put all of those together as things to bring more and better and cheaper products to consumers. It seems like a noble objective in a consumer society. It's certainly what motivated the Chicago School critique and the backlash uh, in the wake of Alcoa and several, several other cases. But I wonder if something hasn't been lost and I wonder if a lot of the debate today, in fact, I don't wonder, it's, it's clear that a lot of the debate today um, says that we've made that trade off to such a great extent that we've lost something. And what it is that we have lost is market access. We have lost the ability for individuals, for small businesses to gain access to, to gain traction in, and to retain viability in many markets. Why has that occurred? It's occurred because of concentration, which has often brought scale. And even though we've seen margins go up in many markets, 
we've also seen costs come down and prices come down such that um, you know, even these prices that might build in a significant margin are a lot lower than they might be in a much more atomized, much less dynamic economy. The flip side is what I think a lot of people are thinking about connected to antitrust today. And as, as Noah Phillips said, these are issues that are traditionally outside of antitrust, I think, but I think they are a lot of what's motivating the debate. The weakened power of workers. When you go from being an owner to a worker, to being one of many workers for a big owner, the power dynamic shifts. And along with that, the income distribution and inequality dynamics change. So all of this gets wrapped into the antitrust debate with the idea that less bigness equals more market access, equals a greater balance of power between workers and owners, and a greater distribution of uh, you know, a, a better and more equitable distribution of wealth. And you hear this from state attorneys generals, from federal officials, from thoughtful commentators across the spectrum. And my question is, to the extent antitrust can address these problems, it seems to me that the consumer welfare standard is the fulcrum. And the thing that we would want to do if we thought antitrust was appropriate for building in, uh, for, for, for addressing these issues, is to do away with the mantra or to reduce the strength of the mantra that we care about competition, not competitors, and to care a little bit more about market access and the viability of competitors in the way that Judge Hand did in the Alcoa case, in the way that the Supreme Court did in Vaughn's Grocery, in the way that occurred in Brown Shoe. So I guess my question is, do we need to write the standard a little bit to build market accessibility and competitors a little bit more back into the antitrust picture and alter the consumer welfare standard in that way? Or is that too dangerous and something we should avoid? And I'm gonna start with Corinne on that since you raised the consumer welfare standard um, and then we'll, we'll go from there. Uh, I, I think it's too dangerous to do. And, and, you know, in terms of these other values that you mentioned, you know, workers or the, you know, the, the fair competition, I'm never sure what fair means. When I used to work at George Mason, if I said fair, Bruce Kobayashi would throw a book at me and say, I don't know what you're talking about. Fair is not an economic concept. And apparently I, uh, anyways, so, you know, incorporating these other ones, I think a lot of people, including you know, Edith uh, Ramirez, when she was chairwoman, gave a great speech in 2014 or 15 in China, explaining about the dangers of incorporating these other factors, and um, and particularly the how it's just not administrable, right? It's it's hard enough to weigh and balance competition concerns within a re relatively a narrowly defined antitrust market, but how do you weigh long term, you know, dynamic, static employment versus price? Um, and, and that the agencies are just really not equipped to do this. Tim? Well, uh, I disagree. And um, actually, I, I thought you put the case for it pretty strongly, uh, Howard. So I think we've been in a, a sort of 40 year experiment um, since the 80s with the uh, uh, sort of fixation or obsession uh, with consumer, uh, with consumer pricing, sort of a price fixation uh, 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 and uh, consumer welfare standard. And uh, you know, I, I think this uh, it was a, I think in some ways a, a nice effort. I, the idea was to try to introduce more rigor into the law and so forth. But I don't think it's been successful um, and has gone uh, far too far. Um, it, you know, so we're sort of judging the last forty years of antitrust against the first, uh, I guess, um, uh, eighty years of antitrust. And I think it was more successful the first eighty years. And I also think um, that antitrust. Um, uh, traditionally and originally it was concerned with uh, many aspects of the economy, not just uh, prices. It was originally concerned with the conditions of competition, uh, smaller producers, uh, uh, workers. Uh, you know, this was its this was the point of the law. So, you know, we're not exactly deviating. In fact, we're getting closer to congressional intent uh, with some of these ideas. I don't know if people really care about that, um, but um, I. I <laughs> I want, I want, and I just think the results, uh, some of them, uh, Howard uh, put out there well, is we have a, a crisis, a, a sense that uh, the economy is rigged, uh, a real sense that it's hard uh, for smaller uh, producers, entrepreneurs to get a start. Most of the markets are, are locked up. 
uh, and uh, I think the key does lie to some extent in softening consumer welfare as the fixation, as the focal point, as the one guidestone to everything in this in this area. I, I think it's just gone too far. And uh, the um, justice, you know, to get back to something that's happening today, the the justice case filed against Google is a, is kind of a bellwether of this. Um, you know, it is not a consumer harm focused case. It is a competition focused case. It suggests that, you know, by sealing all the entrances to the, uh, you know, by sealing off uh, any way to get into the market and compete with Google, that the harm done was harm to competition. And I, I, maybe we'll just see courts uh, go in that direction without explicitly overruling the consumer welfare standard. Instead, what they'll do is get rid of this thing you see show up sometimes, which is essentially a burden on the plaintiff to demonstrate a price related harm uh, in any case. And, um, you know, there's nothing in the statute um, and it's not clearly compelled by the case law, but sometimes people seem to think that that's what you need to do. But I think that's going to shift. And I think it's both popular demand and some sense that the law is failing in its fundamental mission of keeping the economy competitive. And as, as Howard put it, um, making, putting, having that sort of sense of opportunity that, uh, you know, anyone, it's a, it's a fair game. You get in there and, and try it and it's not all logged up by the big guys. I think we've lost that. And I think that the uh, sort of structural problems in the economy reflect that. So sorry for that speech, but um, I, uh, I strongly believe that that is the path forward. Yeah, no, that's helpful. I'm going to make a comment that go to Jeffrey and, and Bill's going to have the last word. Um, um, it's very helpful. And, and Tim, you raised the issue of process and the conditions of competition. And Corinne, I was thinking about your comment about fairness and, and Bruce telling you he didn't know what it meant. Um, but, you know, the Supreme Court itself said they didn't know what fairness meant. They said it in Trenton Potteries in 1927. And the Supreme Court said, you're defending your prices as fair. We don't know what that means. The only way we know a price is fair is if the push and pull of buyers and sellers unfettered by uh, collusion and agreement are producing the prices in the marketplace. That's a fair price. And connecting that to what Tim said, it would seem that a marketplace that pays more attention to access and the conditions of competition uh, would actually free us from having to implicitly assume that a certain outcome is fair and know that we have a process in place that would uh, be more likely to create fair outcomes. So the, the conditions of competition, the accessibility of the market to entrepreneurs and to new firms, something that really has not been front and center, um, you know, as, as a consideration, if you can show low price, high output, which certainly has its, ha has its merits and there are important distributional consequences there. So Jeffrey, to, to, to tweak the question a little bit, but to take it to you, um, has the consumer welfare uh, standard maybe missed some valuable aspects of competitive process that it would be good to restore through uh, greater attention to barriers to entry that even certain at least temporally efficient outcomes in the marketplace might create? Thank you. I think if your case turns on Bonds Grocery, you have lost and you have not made it. <laughs> um, I, I think it's an important example to, to raise here uh, to address exactly your, your question. You know, what was going on in Bonds Grocery was, um, you know, a, a, an exogenous change, right? The, uh, a change in, in the, the structure of cities, the automobile, the nature of grocery stores shifting to supermarkets. Um, the decision in that case took no notice of any of that and uh, would have impeded a, a merger pretty clearly. I mean, not clearly, of course, we don't know for sure, but pretty clearly aimed at trying to compete with uh, in, a, in a changing market. It would have actually precluded access in uh, on the basis of a uh, an effort to, to to you know sort of protect the small competitor whatever, you know whatever the dimension is that you think is is relevant here, it would arguably have had exactly the opposite effect, and um, and I think that you cannot escape the the reality that it's not nearly as simple as Trenton pottery, 
uh, would put it. It, it, you know, identifying where the constraints come from and what would maximize, even if you're trying to maximize the ability of small competitors to, to compete in today's markets, trying to identify what would actually accomplish that is, is far, far from obvious. And it correlates with the consumer welfare standard, not, not perfectly, but at least to, to a sufficient extent that tossing it out, I think would do far more damage than, than benefit. The, today's case is a great example of that, as I raised before. You, you, you know, I don't, I don't see how you could take this position and also excoriate Amex. It seems to me that if you are going to try to take a position that says we should, we should intervene where necessary in the economy to protect, to preserve, um, uh, you know, entry and uh, and the competitive process, and again, there are, you know various ways you could characterize it. I don't see how you could do that without taking account of the kind of analysis that Amex does, like in to, you know today's case that was filed. I don't see how you can bring that case without assessing the consequences for Android, let's say, by uh, constraining Google acting as the default uh, search. I think if everyone understands that the alternative is not um, free Android and, uh, and Google not the default. The alternative is no Android or, or expensive Android. And that, of course, has a substantial effect that is a primary channel of distribution for the competitors that are arguably trying to be protected by this action. If you don't take account of that, you will absolutely get it wrong. Um, so I guess you have a choice. You can get rid of the consumer welfare standard and adopt Amex whole, wholesale, uh, or you can stick with the consumer welfare standard and you should still adopt Amex. No, I mean, very, very, no, very interesting argument in making the point that, look, process fixes on the entry side necessarily uh, require breaks on other kinds of processes. And one is one that would be set by government. The other is one that you see is driven by the exogenous changes in the market and technology. And that's where you're going to place your bet. And it's a strong argument. Bill, last word. Okay. Um, the consumer welfare standard, it's a friggin' Roshark ink block test. It means very different things to, to different people. And in its narrowest application, it is, you know, the plaintiff has to prove pretty much beyond a reasonable doubt that there will be price effects. That's the extreme view, but it's pretty close to being uh, gospel in, in, in the courts. If we leave that term aside and talk about risks, telling a story as we look at a behavior pattern or a proposed acquisition, of risk of long-term harm to consumers and harm to competition. If we use that frame of reference, I think we can be more expansive in what we go after and do it in a way that doesn't ignore uh, a current economic thinking and the advances we've made in that, that social science. So I think there's a way to, uh, to do more. Uh, it may require legislation, but to do more in a way that will foster a more competitive economy. And final point is we are going to see dramatic increases in, in concentration in this economy as we come out of COVID-19. The impact is disproportionate on small and medium-sized business. And so now is probably the time to direct the courts and the law enforcement agencies to step up their vigilance when it comes to anti-competitive behavior and acquisition. Th thanks so much, Bill. Um, you know, really appreciate those those remarks. Corinne, you look like you're about to jump in on something. So I'm, I'm no, nope? okay, yeah. great. Well, look, I want to thank all of you. This has been a terrific discussion and a great way to start this, this series. And, and it comes at a, at a really important moment. Uh, the, the debate is just, the debate that's been going on in the public sphere through hearings, through uh, a lot of academic writing and commentary and activism, that will keep going. It's been enormously valuable. I actually think it's been a great thing and will be a great thing for antitrust. As we move now to what I, I hope will be a next phase of trying to implement a lot of what's coming out of these debates. I think what's clear is that there are really hard questions to be answered. There are gonna to be tough decisions and trade-offs to be made. 
uh, and a lot to consider. I think this panel has done a terrific job of uh, airing those uh, for us today. And I just want to thank you all. Thank you. Thanks, Howard. It was, thank it was you. Everyone. Thank you, Howard. Bye, everyone. Thanks.